go, so I'm just going to paraphrase some poetry. Which you're not meant to be able to paraphrase poetry, just while people come in. Blah, 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 blah. Mountain brow. Blah. Aha. Blah. 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 Aha. Bard. Nameless as the vast. Babble to vastness. So says Allen Ginsberg at the start of Wales Visitation, his 1967 poem about an acid trip in the Black Mountains. Babble to vastness. So that seems to me a fairly neat description of the act of psychedelic poetry. But obviously we'll go into a bit more detail. Really it's the associated state of namelessness that I want to draw attention to because it seems to me to be our metaphorical ground the um, fertile dirtiness from which sprouts these orchards of mind language manifest human. So we return to a state of namelessness, both in the psychedelic experience and as bemused poets, when we see beyond language as merely the habit of thinking we already know what it is we're talking about. Um, when we're tripping, we encounter language alive as something that emerges in and as experience itself, be in the many ways existence says itself. So this is a realm of novelty and inspiration where the only facts seem to be feelings and meaning can complete us without ever finishing itself off. So what I'm basically going to be talking about is sort of language in its primordial sense. You, we've got linguistics and all these ways of trying to talk about, reflect upon language, understand what it is, and they're all great and necessary things. But um, I think of them as secondary, and language as a whole is a much trickier beast, basically. If we want to really start to understand language, we just have to speak it and experience. And so for me, right at the heart of how language is this Trixie Beast is, is metaphor. It's a really slippery customer, such a, a primordial shape-shifting world of categorical fluidity, such that when we come to define it, metaphor itself challenges the very act of its own definition. So there we are. Nonetheless, I'm going to attempt a definition. Right, so... Etymologically speaking, we've got meta and for. Meta is more often translated as sort of after or over. Um, so we get this standard etymological translation as carrying over, which refers to the way in which metaphor quite often acts to um, transfer meaning from a more um, sensory, uh, sort of concrete, familiar realm towards an abstract or conceptual area. And so we find uh, metaphor is a type of analogy. But when, we come, when we encounter something new, something novel, something with, that we don't have a name for, we need to use metaphor in, or analogy to start to get a, to grips with it, basically. But meta, in its original sense, was more about coming with something. So I, I like to translate metaphor even more literally as like a bearing with. So it's language that the longer you bear with it, the more it gives. And it's language that brings with it context, basically. Context after context after context, the associative webs. And so we can start to see how deep metaphor goes. If we couldn't move meaning about, we wouldn't know it was there. If it didn't have context, it wouldn't make any sense. So where it starts to get meta in the modern sense, which we use to talk about something that's self-referential, is when we notice that metaphor is in itself a metaphor. It's given us this image of carrying over or bearing with in order to sort of concretize its conceptual nature. So metaphor is itself a metaphor. And uh, so my favorite sort of standard, it is the standard definition, it's my favorite one, it's metaphor is a figure of speech. And obviously a figure of speech is a metaphor and here it's kind of occurring in a metaphor about metaphor so you have that sort of, you see, we seem to have entered a realm of infinite recursion, the, the horror, metaphorical turtles all the way down. 
But um, for, for me, what all of this points to, it, it, we, we don't ever descend into relativism. Um, metaphor leads us to this sort of middle path. So anyway, where, where, where am I? So yeah, if we can use this notion of figure of speech in a creative sense, if we don't just get stuck in the logical structure of something being self-referential, not being able to make any sense or talk outside itself, we can use figure of speech to think about metaphor with and it can take us places. So talking about metaphor with recourse to further metaphors can get us somewhere in quite a meaningful sense. So before I get into the poetry properly, I want to introduce this other side of metaphor, which is cognitive or conceptual metaphor. So if you ponder the following phrases, I am high, uh, I'm getting spun out, okay, now I'm centered, you've grounded me, I figured it out, I've gotten to grips with it. I see what you mean, man, that is far out. So these are just a few examples of how, well, yeah, conceptual, it's staggeringly widespread in our day-to-day -day language. Fundamentally, um, metaphor sort of underlies the very structures of thought. They reveal how we understand the world in terms of our embodied experiences, which makes our bodies fields of feelings in which language makes senses. So I'm going to return to this vast namelessness. And we can consider this as the literal suspension of what is noun, or else the utter verb verbalization of everything. Um, and this is the condition for the possibility of language embodying itself. It's here that language reveals its primary nature as an act of disclosure. And it's only later, when the poetry is over, that we can think about language literally in terms of representation. Thus, when the bearded bard tells himself to babble, this is a euphemism for poetry. To talk from experience full of innocence, to be the babbling brook using its own body to tell of its traveling paths. Here, we allow language to be its most primal self, making human being poet. And so this self-effacement is a form of permission. To be merely babbling on, we can allow ourselves to say what we need, go where we please. And uh, this is the condition for the possibility of psychedelic poetry, being able to just babble. But obviously, Ginsberg's poem is anything but babble. It's a fucking beautiful and brilliant poem. But I think he needed to say, I'm just babbling on in order to get it out. Um, so the next, I'm looking at two poems today. And this is the next one. It's Michael McClure's peyote poem from 1955. I'll just have a bit of water and I'll read it for you and then unpack a couple of the metaphors in there. Clear, the senses bright, sitting in the black chair, rocker. The white walls reflecting the colour of clouds moving over the sun. Intimacies. The room's not important but like divisions of all space, of all hideousness and beauty. I hear the music of myself and write it down for no one to read. So along with babbling to vastness, we now have a fairly good idea of what psychedelic poetry might be. I hear the music of myself and write it down for no one to read. So it's a very fertile phrase. And for a start, it's kind of tempting to take him literally, which is something we're not supposed to do with metaphor, but it seems to happen again and again in psychedelic poetry when reality seems to be imagining itself through us. What does literal even mean? <laughs> um, so yeah, he could literally be hearing like the sounds of his own biology going about its business, the gurgle of his belly, the hum in his ears, maybe even the fizz of his neurons and all of these potential perceptions would be inevitably orchestrated in experience being conducted through himself and thus somewhat literally musical. But the um, deeper sense I think we get is of noticing thought itself come to being, the music of myself. So being aware of swathes of feeling that move through us, wordless ideas that might then determine themselves in writing. 
And so we can consider this poem a score. Not only is it not the music, but here we are talking about something that's not even words. Um, and so just as we've written music, this instant translation of transimaginative sensation will be somehow different and yet somehow the same each time it's performed. So a poem can have many meanings. Not all of them are going to be opinions, even if they seem to logically contradict or shift over time. They can be thought of as the poem self-differencing. Um, right. So also we are writing for no one to read. And so here we are again giving ourselves permission to say whatever we need to be completely uncensored in our language to bring forth poetry for the sheer psychedelic feck of it. Um, but as well, we've conjured the presence of an absence. In writing for no one to read, we're performing an action for no one to do, which is, in a sense, to say that no one might be someone too. And this speaks directly to us as readers, because if we're reading this, we must be that no one. At least we're no, no longer entirely ourselves. So psychedelic poetry delights in apparent paradox. It's kind of a happily oxymoronic thing filled with sophisticated stupidities. While we find such absurdities fun to trip over, at the same time they present us with no real stumbling block. And so to me this comfort with contradiction manifests uh, textually, primarily, in this uh, idea of em embodying a certain spaciousness. And so we return again and again to the primordial interplay of space and body. So before moving on, I'm just going to quickly look at the first metaphor, which is uh, in the form of a simile. Uh, the room's not important, but like divisions of all space, of all hideousness and beauty. So upon these white walls, we watch the colours of cloud shadows dance. By virtue of this spatial division, this blank plane, we see projected a compressed drama of our solar system, of sun and earth and atmosphere and eyes, and it's intimate, it's all right here. But these particular divisions of space, our, our very own walls and windows, are not particularly important. Um, they seem to be instances of a universal action by which space is distinguishing itself, which in turn talks to our uh, sense of aesthetics, the ways we delineate hideousness and beauty. And this cosmic insight is simply par for the course. It's a mere side effect of paying attention. <laughs> and so, to me, this isn't your average literary metaphor. It seems almost as much a phenomenological observation as any kind of rhetorical device, although it clearly partakes of all these realms. In other words, figures of speech such as these can appear as a natural consequence of reporting from a place upstream in our perceptual processes, a place where everything is happening as one at once, but where that already means at least a few different things. So we're immediately the medium. We no longer see things as we're habituated to, as if they were already there. We seem to be catching them in the very act of appearing. And so this is a realm where subject and object have yet to distinguish themselves from each other. And much of what we find paradoxical in psychedelic poetry is only really truly paradoxical after the fact. It's weird, but it just seems to be how things are in the psychedelic realm. I don't know. I smile to myself. I know all that there is to know. I see all there is to feel. I am friendly with the ache in my belly. The answer to love is my voice. There is no time, no answers. The answer to feeling is my feeling. The answer to joy is joy without feeling. And so to me, these are something like sleight of hand metaphors. These feelings beg questions to which they themselves become the answers. Joy is answered by the negation of its own emotional nature, which is our witnessing it, which is uh, 
you know, being beside ourselves with joy. But this is not two separate things. This is joy in its completeness. So the standard way of talking about literary metaphors is in terms of there being a state of tension between two things that are not literally connected, only juxtaposed for communicative purposes. But here we can sort of see that psychedelic metaphor could be considered a textually unfolding instant of one thing in self-tension. So they're direct reports of unitary acts. They can be, not all of them are. Self-difference in moments, transformations. And so here's one of my favourite examples of this. Spaciousness and grim intensity. Close within myself, no longer a cloud, but flesh, real as rock. So this is a metaphor that moves in two directions at once. The standard metaphorical transfer is from a concrete sensory image to a concept. And we can see that here. We have the image of cloud becoming flesh, becoming rock. But the abstraction that this transfers to uh, simultaneously produces a movement back in the other direction. Um, it's as if space had become merely a conceptual thing, and here we witness its ingress back into flesh. And this space flesh, concrete as rock, in the sense that now we can actually grasp it. We're no longer just thinking about space. It's present as an aspect of our being embodied. And so with this in mind, I'm going to move back to the Ginsberg trip. All the valley quivered, one extended motion, a giant wash, a wavelet of immensity, roar of the mountain wind slow, sigh of the body, one majesty the motion, White fog poured down on the mountain's head, mixing my beard with the wet hair of the mountainside, smelling the brown, vagina-moist ground. One being so balanced, so vast, that its softest breath moves every floweret in the stillness on the valley floor, lifts trees on their roots, birds in the great draught, grown through beast and neck, a great Oh, to earth heart. So this is a metaphorical act of personification, and it's a very old one at that. But there's a subtle genius to this portrayal of Mother Nature that we might not notice at first. In talking out the body of the mountain person, not once is there any reference to mind. Um, there's no talk about consciousness, nothing about thought as we ordinarily think it. The, the entire scene is unified, animated, brought to life by virtue of one great breath. So the mountain is the head and body of nature as engaged in meditation, focused on its breath, which is our breath too. And so it's through the feeling of our own no mind, our experiences of being conscious in wider senses that we might begin to understand the ways in which nature is. Well, let's just say the ways in which nature is. Mind the gap. <laughs> so this is the notion of embodied cognition that underlies conceptual metaphor. But here it seems to be almost turning itself inside out. In being aware of our breath, we can know without having to really think about it that at no point are our bodies entirely our own. Yet this is what we are. Our cognition embodied in ever more enveloping forms of embodiment, which is not necessarily to say microcosm, macrocosm, as above, so below, so much as to state that everything shares an interfacing nature. Being as bodies that distinguish ourselves in and as spectra of space, one great breath embodies this space sensationally brought to life, and all meaning needs this space to breathe, to be. So this field of feeling is outside and inside and all throughout. It's the very abyss made imminent. 
I'm getting abstract, I'm sorry, but I'm talking about space. But, uh, ours is a world of phenomenal gaps, uh, spaces that reveal in and as themselves a variety of substances and properties, yet fundamentally such spaces will not be closed. Such primordial gapness can only be displaced. And so this is another way of seeing the explanatory gap that can be a problem for theory of mind. And this is basically the tension between brain-based mechanisms and mind-based experiences, or in a sense, quantification and qualia. Um, and I'm sort of using body and space as a, a metaphor to try and explore that. Anything that bridges this gap becomes metaphor. Thus, for poets, it's not a problem. Um, it's the infinitely expressive self-explanatory gap, a form of permission given necessarily as limit, a kind of continual knowing that always says yes. Um, so let's finish the breath. The great secret is no secret. Senses fit the winds. Visible is visible. Heaven breath and my own symmetric airs, wavering through antlered green fern, drawn in my navel. Same breath as breathes through Capali Vin. Sounds of Aleph and Orm through forests of gristle. My skull and Lord Hereford's knob equal. All Albion one. So Lord Hereford's knob is uh, the name of the mountain, but I think Ginsburg was probably reasonably fond of the double entendre. Um, when I first saw this line, visible is visible, I thought, shit, I'm trying to make a case for psychedelic metaphor, and the poem I've chosen ends with what seems to be an anti-metaphorical metaphor. <laughs> what doth this mean? Um, and then I noticed that McClure's poem, which is a very different poem in so many ways, uh, curiously enough, it performs the same sort of trick. The room is empty of all but visible things. There are no categories or justifications. I am sure of my movements. I am a bulk in the air. Such that both poems seem to be talking about the psychedelic experience as a journey beyond metaphor. So I realised that due to the sort of imaginative nature of the experience and of the poems, they're filled with metaphor, um, this must be none other than the radical acceptance of metaphor. Its negation is somehow accomplished through allowing it completely. And this process stems quite naturally from giving ourselves permission to be performatively psychedelic, to act imaginatively and flow. Thus, the psychedelic poet reveals something of the nature of what our bodies tell us we are, enshrined openings. Our bodies tell us that language tells us, that metaphor tells us that being is always seeing through. But this uh, seeing through is a seeing to, to. Sometimes literally a seeing to. But I, I meant that in the sense of seeing we're seeing through, but we also see something. We're seeing too. So, visible is visible. Uh, it's kind of funny to me that these words have the same literal structure as the primary proposition in formal logic. A is A. But that, in actual fact, they point to a transcendence of this law of the same. These words say that what it means for things to be visible has in itself become visible. So not... A is A, nor simply A is not A, nor necessarily A is to B as C is to D, but more like A to Z, aka any of these, if you so very please, but any, always, never only. And so this is the imaginative limit which allows us to say what we like, um, which is how we can be free while continuing to exist. Meaning, meaning cannot be exhausted, though in itself that can exhaust us. This ultimate spaciness of our bodies, these cosmically anarchic ways we are ruled by nothing, being the ever 
we're ever in the presence of that which is neither here nor there. The irreducible, <laughs> unexpandable, imaginative simplexities of this primordially positive negation. Uh, the utter holiness of ours elves, in other words. Uh, this is the very innateness of structure, as well as the root of our opportunities for deconstruction. And so metaphor, like the psychedelic experience, is metastructural. In exploring it, we become more aware of our own conceptual and perceptual processes, by which we realize knowledge as grounded dynamically in the body, which leads us to say that truth in a very primordial sense, necessitates self-disclosure. Language is a self-differencing, continually evolving, hologrammatic unity that rearranges itself according to what is being said, which is what beings say, being says. This is the metaphorical heart of psychedelic analogic, which is merely poetry in other words. Okay, uh, that, that's it, but uh, uh, when I was, thank you. <laughs>